Good day, Great Tent. Welcome to the first Skype broadcast of Turn Able's Physical Science Grade 10. Um, before I start, I'd just like to welcome you and also to suggest that you join the turnable.org website and then join our Physical Science Grade 10 class. And the reason I suggest that is because then you can message me and you can tell me what you want to learn about and you can ask questions. I may or may not see the messaging during the actual broadcast. It depends how Intricate, <laughs> intricate the details are in the broadcast, but I will definitely read all the messages and address every single one of them um, either the next day or when the next grade 10 science lesson occurs. So what I've decided to do today is because we're doing revision, I've decided to start off right at the beginning of the year and do math and material. So we're going to first start with the revision of math and material, um, which obviously is going to be the stuff that you know from grade 8 and grade 9. And then we're going to move on to obviously more intricate and more difficult stuff that isn't actually difficult at all. And we're going to work through matter and material today and let's see how far we go. Right, so let's get started. Oh, and I don't know what happened there. So let's see what happened. I don't know what happened. Let's get started. Right, so that's what we're doing, revision of matter and material. So first of all, you need to know what is matter. Anything that has mass or volume or mass and volume is matter. So anything that we can put on a scale, whether it be this old fashioned uh, triple beam balance type scale or nice digital new scale, if it makes a reading on that scale, okay, whether it be very small or very big and it has mass, then it is matter. Also, if it can take up space, if it can occupy volume, then it is matter. So basically everything around you is made up of some type of matter. So your pen, your pencil, the cell phone, the laptop, everything around you, including yourself, is matter. Now there are two types of matter. There are natural materials and there are man-made materials. The natural materials include your wood, your pine cones, the leather for your shoes, your special minerals like gold and silver, feathers, rocks, plants, and of course your chalk, which is a type of rock actually, and wool. Your man-made materials are things that are plastics and your many plastics actually, if you look at this, and your fibrous type materials, okay your nylons and the paper like the toilet paper and the book paper and everything else and then glass as well is also a man-made material so properties of matter are very important there are two types of properties there are physical properties and there are chemical properties and what we're going to do is go through the different types of properties that matter have because you guys are going to have to be able to identify the different types of properties and and also be able to explain them so that's what we're going to do in this first part of the lesson so Physical properties. These can be seen, felt, or measured. Okay. Physical changes occur without any changes to the molecular composition. Okay. We don't actually change the molecules at all. The molecular composition stays the same. And I'm going to cheat here a little bit and tell you and give you an example. I should actually give you this example later, but I'm going to do it now. If you think of water, right? What is the easiest one for us to understand when it comes to physical changes because we know that water comes in three phases well three official phases there's the plasma as well which we're not worried about now there is solid there is liquid and there is gas okay in the solid we've got little ice blocks right but they are made up of your little water molecules that are just rearranged into little crystal lattices okay so they're all nicely stacked together and that's what makes it solid if we heat it up what happens these little molecules start moving around quickly and we end up with a container with water in it Okay, but again, every single one of these little molecules is made up of your H2O, your oxygen with your two little hydrogens. Then if we heat this up with a little flame, what do we get? We get gas or what we call water vapor or steam. 
okay, depending on the temperature. The water vapor and steam is again not broken up, it's still little water molecules. So do you see there's no molecular change and nothing has broken up, the water molecules haven't changed at all. All that's happened is it's gone from being a solid to a liquid to a gas. So this is a physical change from melting is a physical change and boiling is a physical change. Chemical changes cannot be seen or felt. This is how a substance reacts in a chemical reaction. So when we take our water molecule and we send an electric current through it and we end up with oxygen and some hydrogen gas, that there is a chemical reaction. When the water molecule actually breaks up entirely, that's a chemical reaction. So let's talk some more about our physical properties. The first physical property you need to think about is your appearance. What does it look like? Is it big or very small? So we want to talk about size, the color, okay, the texture. Is it shiny or is it smooth? Is it rough? Okay, strength. Is it very strong? Can it withstand high pressures? And the reason I've got this pretty picture of the diamond is because you should know that diamond is one of the strongest materials in the world. In fact, we use diamonds to cut other materials. That's how strong it is. Or is it soft and fluffy like cotton wool? Then we have to talk about thermal conductivity. And yes, you guys need to understand the thermal conductivity. In other words, does it conduct heat? Does it conduct heat? That is a physical property. And why? Because all that's happening is the atoms are jiggling up and down. Well, the molecules are jiggling up and down. They're not breaking apart. They're just moving faster. And that's what's happening with thermal conductivity. So for example, and you guys should know this by now, if you have a pan, this part of the pan is made to conduct heat, right? So it's going to be a good thermal conductor. This part of the pan over here is hopefully made of a thermal insulator. So it stays nice and cold so you can actually pick up the pan. But this, you want to conduct the heat so that you can cook your food. So that is another physical property, thermal conductivity or electrical conductivity. Does it conduct electricity? Does it conduct electricity? And yes, that is a potato. That is in fact a very big potato. It might even be a sweet potato. And because of the ions in a potato and the amount of energy that's stored in them, they can actually be used as a source of electrical energy. I have to tell you though that that light there is an LED. And LEDs, light emitting diodes, do not need a lot of energy to make light. The reason I say this is because I've actually done this experiment with some of my students. You need a heck of a lot of potatoes to get a little digital display to work. Okay, a heck of a lot of potatoes. So, seriously, that gives off current. It can give off current, but it doesn't give off current at a very big rate. But electrical conductivity is can it conduct electricity and again that is a physical property so if we had to look over here i'm really hoping you guys know that these copper wires copper wires are really good conductors of electricity whereas the rubber that's around it is insulating which is great because we want to be able to conduct electricity through these wires but not actually burn ourselves or make the electricity go somewhere else or short something out. So that's why we have the insulation around it. Is it brittle? Can it crack? Okay, you guys, I'm really hoping you've never experienced this. If you drop a phone, there's a very strong chance that your screen will crack. And that is showing that glass is brittle. Okay, so is it brittle or is it malleable? Now, malleable is another word for bendy. Except, as I say to my students, if you ever use the words bendy in a test or an exam, I will never acknowledge that I've ever used the word bendy. It just means, malleable means how easily can we bend the material. Or ductile, and ductile is can we put it into a thin 
wire. Okay, so ductile is how easily can we pull it into a wire? Pull it into a wire. Okay, so you guys need to be able to recognize all these physical properties. There are a couple of more, I have to say. Okay, there are a couple more, but you need to be able to identify them. So if I say to you, what is happening here? What physical property is being shown over here on the cell phone? You need to say, well, the glass is brittle. Or if I say, what is happening here? When this metal is being bent, you need to say it's malleable. Right. Magnetic versus non-magnetic, that is one of your physical properties. Density is a physical property. Now let's talk a little bit about density. Density is actually defined as mass over volume. Mass over volume, okay. But an easy way to think of it is how many parts there are in the container, how many parts of the solute are there in the container. So if I had to show you this diagram and I said to you which one is more dense, I'm really hoping that you guys will say that the right hand cylinder has got a greater density than the left hand cylinder. And the reason for that is because we can see that there are more parts per unit volume. That's what we say, we are more parts per unit, unit volume. So what we're saying is that in the same volume, there are more bits of matter, okay, more atoms of matter than in this volume here, okay? So if you have a look at this pretty picture here, and I always include it when I'm talking about density, and the reason is that it is a beautiful illustration of the different densities of different objects. And some of this is quite interesting and surprising. But what you should know is that objects that are less dense, if they're less dense, if they're less dense, what happens? They float on more dense. So objects or liquids that are less dense float on the more dense. Okay, so what am I saying therefore? I'm saying that water is more dense than a cherry tomato. I mean, it's less dense than a cherry tomato. Or that lamp oil over here is less dense than rubbing alcohol or vegetable oil. And this is how lava lamps are made, by the way, basically. Lava lamps, what they've got is a liquid and they've got some wax in it. And when the wax heats, it forms the liquid and it goes up and it's just really rotating it and this is kind of what happens in a lava lamp. If you guys know what a lava lamp is, if not, go ask your parents. One of them would definitely know what a lava lamp is, hopefully. Okay, more physical properties. Melting point. This is the temperature at which a solid becomes a liquid. So we spoke about this earlier where we had ice and it became water. And the temperature at which ice becomes water, which we know at this point is zero degrees Celsius, is called the melting point. Now, please understand that ice isn't going into water at zero degrees Celsius, isn't the only melting point. So different substances have got different melting points. So as soon as the solid becomes a liquid, then we say that it has gone through its melting point or the temperature at which that happened was its melting point. A boiling point is a temperature at which the liquid becomes a gas. So remember earlier we spoke about a water becoming water vapor, water vapor. Okay, and at that, in this case, it's 100 degrees Celsius, but that is the boiling point. Okay, so those are important when we talk about physical properties. Okay, now these physical properties are very, very important. We'll talk about chemical properties later when we talk about reactions, but those are all the physical properties you need to know. Right, let's move on to a new part about matter and material. Let's talk about mixtures. So what is a mixture? A mixture is a combination of two or more substances. They maintain their physical properties. They don't change whatsoever. 
and the substances making up the mixture can be separated by physical means okay those are all the things that are part of the definitions of a mixture if i say to you what is a mixture and i say you got three marks tell me what is a mixture you'll say it's a combination of two or more substances they maintain their physical properties and now we know what physical properties we're talking about and they make up they make up the substances that make up the mixtures can be separated by physical means. Okay, happy with that. Okay, so let's talk about, let's look at what I'm actually talking about. Let's look at the examples of mixtures. So this is a typical everyday example of a mixture. These are sweets. I was very tempted to call them licorice all sorts, except I look at the picture and I see no licorice. So this is just a bag of different types of sweets. And why is it special? Well, it's very easy for me to say, okay, I would like you to pick out every one of these sugary type deals, these funny overly type, I don't know, tempe type deals with just covered in sugar. And how could you do it? You could hand pick them out. You can take them out one by one by one by one to be a bit tedious, but you could. That's a mixture, right? Yeah, we have something slightly more scientific. This is the yellow stuff is sulfur powder, powder, and the gray stuff is iron filings, okay, the gray stuff is iron filings, okay, and if you made a mixture of sulfur and iron filings, the way you would separate them out is with a magnet. Why? Because the fact that iron filings are magnetic and sulfur is not. And I hope you can see from this that this iron filings, there's nothing really wrong with them. Okay, so there might be a little bit of sulfur in between these dots, and there's still some iron filings here, but we could go through this again and again and again. Eventually, we'd have pure yellow powder over here, and we'd have pure, I don't know, dark gray iron filings over here. Okay, so in that way, we can say that there's obviously, by putting the sulfur and the iron filings together, there hasn't been any physical change. There hasn't been a I mean, there's been a physical change. There hasn't been any chemical change, okay? We haven't made a new compound. So there are two types of mixtures. There's heterogeneous and homogeneous. Okay, so mixtures that are heterogeneous are... Okay, now just before I say anything else, I say heterogeneous and homogeneous. If your teacher said it in any other way, it really doesn't matter. It totally depends on what their teacher said and what their professor said when they were studying this, okay? It totally doesn't matter as long as you understand what we're talking about. Okay, so heterogeneous mixtures are mixtures that are in different phases, different phases. So over here, you've got a bowl of cereal, and I'm hoping that you can clearly see that that's milk, which is a liquid. And this bit here is the cereal, which actually looks a bit like granola. Okay, but that is obviously a solid. So that is a heterogeneous mixture. If I really wanted to, I could wait for this to all the milk to evaporate and then I could take out the cereal afterwards. I could easily separate it out, okay? Yeah, we've got a nice, beautiful ice glacier. And this is the ocean, which is water. So again, this is solid. And this is liquid, right? So again, we've got two different phases. Homogeneous mixtures or homogeneous mixtures are in the same phase. So what I've got here is actually some vinegar. Okay, now vinegar is interesting because vinegar is made of a mixture. Most people don't think it's a mixture, but it is. It's made of a mixture of ethanoic acid. Ethanoic acid, you don't need to know that. And water. Okay, you just need to know it's a mixture. Okay, and yeah, we've got coffee. Now, why is coffee an homogenous mixture? Well, I know you put sugar in it, but we don't just leave the sugar at the bottom of the coffee, and we don't just leave the coffee granules at the bottom and then pour in the water and we don't stir. Of course we stir. We stir to get a beautiful homogenous mixture where the coffee and the sugar are all dissolved 
into the liquid to make a beautiful coffee blend which is homogenous and everything in that will be liquid. Now I admit that some of you are going to say to me, no, but when I'm finished drinking my coffee there's still a few granules left. Yes, that's true. That's because you didn't stir enough or because you added too much and then you had a saturation point happening. So what happens with saturation is that is a point where nothing else can dissolve into it. In other words, you added too much sugar or you added too much coffee into that cup and there was no more space for the water to absorb any of those molecules, okay? But if you add just the right amounts, what will happen is you'll have a beaut when you finish the cup of coffee, there'll be no more sugar at the bottom and there'll be no more coffee granules at the bottom. And that means that you mixed it properly and that is a homogenous mixture. So now let's move on to pure substances. We've been talking about mixtures. Now we want to talk about pure substances, which are effectively elements and compounds. So what is a pure substance? Pure substances consist of only one type of substance. So they're the opposite of mixtures, right? They cannot be separated by physical means. Okay, we cannot pick things out of them. And elements and compounds are examples of pure substances. Elements and compounds are examples of pure substances. So elements, what are elements? Elements cannot be broken down into simpler substances. In fact, the basic building block of an element is an atom. And before we carry on, because this is a revision lesson, just to make sure that I haven't left anything out, let's just talk about this little atom. Okay, I must make sure that you know that the nucleus of the atom has got two elements to it. Okay, it's got a lot more, but the two that you need to know about are protons and neutrons. Now, protons and neutrons are equal in size, okay, they have the same mass, but protons are positively charged, right? And neutrons, as is said from their name, are neutral, right? Pretty obvious, right? And then you've got electrons in the electrons orbit the nucleus, okay, the electrons orbit the nucleus. And what's important about this is firstly, e electrons are tiny, okay, the whole atom's tiny, but seriously, the electrons are tiny, even compared to the protons and neutrons. They're approximately 2,000 times smaller, okay, in mass, but, 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 they have the same size, charge, okay, as the proton, but negative. Okay, so in other words, to put that in perspective, one electron will, the charge of one electron will cancel out the charge of one proton. Okay, one electron will cancel out the charge of one proton. But remember these electrons, so this is not drawn to scale. These electrons are tiny compared to the size of the protons and neutrons. And most of the mass of the atom is coming from this nucleus. Okay, most of the mass is coming from the nucleus. So those are atoms and atoms make up everything. So elements can only be broken up into their atoms. That's it, there's nothing else. So let's talk about the periodic table. Now the periodic table was made up by actually quite a few people, but the person who brought out the, the original new version of the periodic table that we use is a dude by the name of Dmitry Mendeleev. And he was a Russian. And what he did was he actually took each of these elements, the elements that he had at the time, and he 
cut them out and put them into cards and then effectively he paid patience with it. Okay, he laid out the cards into such a way so eventually he was matching their characteristics and he came up with a very basic table of the periodic table of elements which looks very similar to this. And the reason it wasn't identical was because they actually hadn't discovered some of the elements yet. So this is the periodic table of elements and I'm really hoping that you know it already but if you don't please get to know it. In your school books or your files for science you should have a periodic table of elements and it should be at hand almost all the time okay the only time you really don't need to have the periodic table of elements next to you is when you're doing the physics component but the rest of the time when you're doing chemistry you should have this periodic table of elements with you because there's so much information we can get from it and i'm going to teach you a bit about that today so first of all what is the periodic table tell us it gives us some symbols for the elements so when we are writing equations about we're using the elements so that we can work out like the recipes the equations for reactions we don't write out the element names we actually use symbols so I am sure that your teachers have made you learn the symbols for all the elements up to at least the first 20 and then they've added in an extra few so just as an example, we've got gold, which has the symbol AU. We have copper, which is the symbol of CU. We have oxygen, which is a symbol of O. And iron, which has the symbol FE. FE. Okay. So I know those because I've been teaching science for several years. You guys need to learn them. You need to make sure you know the symbols of the elements. And in fact, I'm just going to go back for a second and suggest something. I would like to suggest that you guys all make sure you know the first 20 elements up to calcium. And then I'm going to quickly mark off the ones that you really, really need to learn. And I'm serious about this. You need to go and learn these because it's going to make your life easy. Just as much as in junior school when the teachers went along and said to you, go learn your times table and you scoffed at them you're like why should i learn what six times seven is i will have a calculator well actually it kind of makes maths a lot easier if you know that six times seven is 42 if you don't fine but it does make maths a little bit harder for you okay or that one plus one equals two for that matter okay that is something you've learned it's not something you've been shown so i would really strongly suggest that will you go and practice this now not right now first watch this <laughs> the lesson and go and learn the following symbols in fact in my classes i make the children learn these my students learn them i test them all because of the fact that it is so useful so the first 20 then i would say you need to know manganese you need to know iron um copper zinc okay nickel is important but not that important um, silver is quite important, gold is pretty important, mercury is important. Okay, the whole of group seven up to iodine. Because um, you need to know bromine and iodine. What else? And I think that's it for now. So I would say that you really need to know the first 20 plus those. Um, I could throw in chromium, but I'm not going to, and cobalt and nickel, but I'm not going to. Those are the ones that you really, really need to know. Okay, for at least grade 10 and high, oh, and platinum. Platinum. Okay, sorry, I get excited about science. Can you tell? Okay, right. So please go learn those if you want to do well in science you need to know your symbols for your periodic table now periodic tables not just to help you with your symbols there are a whole bunch of other information that you will learn from your periodic table so we will talk about that in a minute but let's talk about compounds compounds are made up of two or more elements and they can be broken down by chemical means into simpler elements so an example of this would be for example uh, i don't know we can take carbon dioxide and we can heat it up and we can form carbon and oxygen obviously or we could take something else like sugar and heat it up or and put it in the sun and it makes some carbohydrates so basically we can break up big molecules into their basic elements Compounds have interesting formula, but they're obviously made up 
of the elemental names, which is another reason why it's important that you know the formulas. The compounds usually consist of molecules or formula units. So the elements making up a compound are always occur in a fixed ratio. So what does that mean? That means that if we have a hydrogen molecule, it means that we always have one hydrogen attached to another hydrogen. Okay, there's a fixed ratio, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. Or oxygen is a diatomic molecule that you should know about, O2, nitrogen, chlorine. But have a look at these down here. Do you see we've got carbon dioxide? Now carbon dioxide always forms in this ratio. So it'll be one carbon joined on to two oxygen. In fact, there's a double bonds. Okay, in fact, as you can see from the structure, it does the C double bonded O, double bonded O. It's a linear molecule, that, which means it's along a straight line. Nitrogen dioxide always forms with two oxygens and one nitrogen. Water, two hydrogens on oxygen. And nitrogen oxide is NO as it shows here. Okay, so what we're saying is that compounds change if this ratio changes okay it's a different compound if it doesn't have the same ratio how do we test for purity well we can look at the melting point so let's say i say to you i want to know if i have got pure alcohol okay in it pure ethanol in a jar what i what could i do well every element has its own melting point Okay, and what is the melting point again? It is the temperature at which it changes from a solid to a liquid or vice versa. That is the melting point. Or we can look at the boiling point, which is the temperature at which a liquid changes to a gas or vice versa. Now, every single substance, every single element and every single compound has their own melting point and boiling point. So if I am taking a container and I want to know if it is pure, I will heat it up and I will find the temperature at which it boils. And if the temperature is different, if it's vastly lower or greatly higher, then the temperature that the textbook says I should find the boiling point to be, then I know it's not pure because then I know that there are other molecules inside that container that are affecting the boiling point. Okay. Another way we can do this is to find the purity is to look at chromatography. So let's look at this. I'm just going to erase the writing. Okay. This is how chromatography works. Okay, it's a very basic version of chromatography. So um, if you've ever watched CSI or anything like this, this is one of the methods they can use when they say they've used a chromatograph. Okay, they take your ink spot and they put it on a piece of paper and then they put it inside a little beaker that's got water. Now this paper is absorbent, so what happens is the water runs up the paper, it gets absorbed up the paper. And as it's absorbed up the paper, what happens is that the dye that made this ink spot separate out. So they separate out into different sections. So some of the dyes, actually travel further because they're more absorbent than others. So you can see that this black spot, the officially black ink, is made up of some blue, some purpley magenta, some yellow, and that's just the remainder. And it does actually work. Here's a picture of it in, red li in real life. You can see that this probably was a red, this is a blue, and this is a green. And you can see the green actually has a little bit of blue in it, and the red has a little bit of orange and yellow going on. So what they can do is if they were doing this in CSI or one of those TV programs, is that they would be associating each of these colors with an element because that's what they do. And then they can say, well, actually, this thing here has got these different types of elements. So it's not just a pure ink spot, black ink spot, it's all broken up. Or another way they could do it is they could say, well, we know that, I don't know, Faber-Castell, Faber-Castell's pens give this type of print, 
okay and honest to goodness there is someone whose job it is to go and find all the different pens out there and make little dots and see what type of chromat chromatograph it brings out so they can match it for the criminal investigations so and that's actually forensic investigations sounds interesting but it actually can be quite a tedious job right now let's talk about metals non-metals and metalloids Again, we need to talk about our elements. So remember I said to you that the periodic table gives you lots more information than just the names of the elements, okay? Another thing it helps us with is deciding, or look, it's been, what's been done is that it's been separated out into metals, non-metals, and metalloids. So we can use the periodic table to see where these are. So elements are classified according to both the chemical properties and their structures. They can be grouped in the three groups of metals, non-metals, and metalloids, which are also called semi-metals. And they're arranged in the periodic table as such. So let's talk about the metals. First of all, these are found on the left-hand side of the periodic table. When they say the left, they don't just mean this side here. They mean from here all the way through to here, and then some more. Okay, my little bracket didn't work. In fact, everything on the left of my jagged line, jagged line, yeah, these are all metals. In fact, there are 80 of them. So, if you ever want to be able to identify the metals on the periodic table, you need to know that they're on the left-hand side of the periodic table on the left of this jagged line over here. Right, properties of metals. They are hard. Okay, and here are examples of metals. You've got bronze, metal, sludge. Okay, we'll talk about the metal sludge in a minute. Steel, brass, aluminium. This is cast iron and copper. Now, some of these are basically a combination of more than one metal, which is called an alloy. And the metal sludge is basically a mixture of these <laughs> metal alloys that is left over when we make other things. Okay, so they are hard, they are shiny, they are good conductors of heat as well as good conductors of electricity. So these are the properties of metals. And again, I'm really sorry, but you need to know the properties of the metals just as much as you need to know the properties of the non-metals and of the metalloids. The non-metals. These are found on the right-hand side of the periodic table. So, remember I said to you, left-hand side of the squiggly line were the metals, right? Now, on the right-hand side of that squiggly line, these are the non-metals. So, there are very few non-metals on the periodic table. There are only about 20. Okay, so what are the properties of non-metals? Well, first of all, they're soft. A lot of them are gas at room temperature. Let's look back. First of all, there's carbon, which is very soft. You guys know carbon, we actually use in pencils. Okay, when we talk about pencil lead, it's actually made out of carbon graphite. Okay, so it's actually very soft. Or if you want to think about your charcoal bricks, that's carbon. Nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, helium, neon, argon, uh, chlorine, bromine, all of these are gases at room temperature. So they're soft. Okay. Right. Moving on. They're dull. They're not very shiny at all. They are bad conductors of heat and they are bad conductors of electricity. The only exception is carbon. The only exception is carbon. Carbon is a very good conductor. Conductor of electricity. Okay. Right. Let's move on to our metalloids or semi-metals. Our metalloids or semi-metals. Right. So, I think you can gather that if I said that everything on this, this side of the zagged line, the zigzag line, <laughs> jagged line, are metals, and everything on this side are non-metals, then the only thing left, the green things, they're the metalloids, okay? So they are found in the diagonal down the periodic table next to the non-metals and next to the metals, they're between them, okay? 
And they're about seven. Let's count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Seven. There you go, seven. Okay, the reason they say about seven is because sometimes people argue about carbon because of the fact that carbon conducts electricity. So sometimes people think that carbon can be considered a metalloid. But there are seven. Okay, moving on. So what are the properties of metalloids? Metalloids are cool because metalloids have properties of both metals and non-metals. And they can conduct electricity under certain conditions and are called semiconductors. And these two pictures here are using silicon. Silicon can be used in silicon chips in your computers, okay? Um, and they can be used in very, very effectively to conduct electricity, or they can be used to make artificial skin for burn victims. Okay, and that actually there, what you're seeing there is a picture of very thin artificial skin made from silicon, which is going to be applied to a person. I don't know if you can see, but those are actually gloves. And this was a real life picture taken from an operation that was occurring and they were going to use the silicon. Right, electrical conductors, semiconductors and insulators. Let's talk about electrical conductors. Electrical conductors are substances that conduct electricity well. Metals are an example of electrical conductors and the reason is because they see of delocalized electrons. Let me give you a little hint. If ever there's an exam question and they say to you, why do metals conduct electricity so well? If you put in the phrase C of delocalized electrons, I guarantee you, you will get marks. So please learn this phrase. Okay, so now that I've told you to learn the phrase, let me explain it. So what this picture is showing basically is these kernels, which are your protons or the positive nuclei. And I'm going to draw it slightly differently. I'm going to draw it over here. And I'm going to draw it slightly differently so that you can understand what's going on. So let's pretend that these things here are the atoms, the big atoms. And what's different from my drawing to this drawing is that there are electron shells around these atoms, but they haven't drawn them. Whereas I am drawing it here, my nuclei, and here are my shells. So all my dots are nuclei. And the outer circles that I'm drawing are actually the outer energy levels where the electrons go around. Okay. So we know with non-metals that when your atoms come along, what happens? You've got a nucleus. Let me draw it over here. You've got a nucleus, which has got protons and neutrons in it usually, and then there is an orbital. And remember, an orbital is where you're most likely to find an electron. Okay. Let me just change color quickly. Right. So the electron goes around, la, 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 all the way around. And remember, it's 3D, so it might go around like that. But the point is it's going around in this orbital. Okay, so now you get metals. But remember that metals are all made up of the same element. They're made up of the same element. Which means that every one of these energy levels are at the same energy space, but there are no spaces between these atoms. They're all stuck together and the energy levels actually overlap. So what happens is that the electron can go around, for example, this atom here. Okay, but when it gets here, this energy level is actually overlapped with this energy level here. So the electron, let me change color again so you can see what I'm doing. Hmm. The electron over here has the option to either carry on going around this atom or if this atom is looking like it doesn't have an electron, it could go around here. Okay, so it could do that. So that is effectively what we mean by C of delocalized electrons because if we put a current across this wire, because we would say that this is a wire made up of your atoms of a metal, and I made the positive end of the battery be on this side, the positive end okay, and the negative end be on this side. Then what's going to happen is the electron from this 
one will be pulled off. But then electrons could fill into that side from this atom which is sitting next to it or from that atom or from that atom. So basically your electrons could actually flow like this. They could go la 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 around, 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 around and out. And they can flow anywhere around. And remember that again, this is three dimensional. And this is what this drawing is trying to show you. It's trying to show you that this electron, for example, has followed that path. This one's gone along here. This one's gone along there, et cetera, et cetera. So these electrons, in fact, this electron has done this one here that's done this, has effectively done this. It's gone out and through and up. And at every juncture there, there is an opportunity for the electron to either continue around the atom it's going around or to continue around that atom there. And it totally depends on whether or not it sees that electron around that atom. And that again depends on whether that electron has been sucked off or moved off this atom by the positive charge. So that is what we mean by C of delocalized electrons. And I see now that it is time, the end of the lesson, I haven't quite finished this with these um, these definitions of electrical conductors, but I will carry on with this in our next lesson on physical science, grade 10 physical science on Thursday. Right, I hope that that's been helpful. Please have a wonderful um, day and please join me again at the next lesson on, t on Thursday. Have a great day.